Today we're coming to the third part of our study in this chapter. Having noted God's dealings with Israel and uh, then with Moab and with Judah, we're going to focus a little bit more on Judah this morning. We have looked at the nation that failed in its duty, the nation that flourished in its disobedience, and today we will look finally at the nation that floundered in its discipline, and that, of course, was Judah. You'll find your study notes if you haven't received a copy. They are at the door. Make sure you get one so that you can follow through as we consider the final teachings of the chapter. Today we're going to follow the theme, A Mysterious Flood with the Appearance of Blood. A Mysterious Flood with the Appearance of Blood. Let's have a little moment of prayer. Loving Father, we thank you for this privilege given to us to spend a little time in the study of your word. We recognize that this is not just a homily, it's not just a, a process whereby we gain more knowledge of scripture, but we draw near to your throne of grace today, praying that we may be like clay in the potter's hand. For your word, shapes and fashions us. Your word purges us. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. We pray that we will sense the healing, cleansing power of the word of the living God. Enter and engage our minds and hearts today so that we will leave this church knowing that God has met with us. Our lives have been altered, changed, and molded a little more into the likeness of the Lord Jesus. Hear our prayer. Forgive our sins. Grant us your blessing in order that we may honor the name of the Lord. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Now for the um, purpose of our study this morning, we're going to have a very broad look at the entire chapter. And you know from past Sundays that the uh, it will mean, of course, that we will not be able to go in in great detail to some of the issues that are raised. Uh, we do, however, want to make sure that we get the full picture and we therefore have a full understanding of what the writer is wanting to convey to us as we discover and rediscover how God deals with his people in his providence. And that word providence is a very significant word. Uh, in the world, the word that they use is luck. You have a lucky day or a lucky moment or whatever. For the child of God, we don't believe in luck. We look to God for providence. Providence is the administration of the purpose of God in the intimate details of our lives and our environment. So when blessing comes, we know it's not luck. It's providence. And even when things come into our lives that are not so acceptable to us, we know nonetheless that this is providence. And some way, somehow, somewhere, God will reveal to us the reason for that particular moment in our lives. This morning, we want to focus on what becomes, in a sense, the final aspect 
of this miracle that has been building in its intensity and its excitement. And we're now about to see where it has all led us to. Our concentration will be on the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat. And uh, we're going to look at how under his direction the nation floundered in its discipline. And by that we mean that God had already revealed his will and purpose to them, but like so many of us, uh, he decided that there were times when he did not need to apply to God for permission to do the things he wanted or decided to do. And I'm sure that we will not escape not only the hints but the strong proddings of the Spirit when we are reminded of those occasions in our own lives when we feel that we are entitled to make decisions without consulting the divine rule and seeking the divine economy. And that in turn leaves us at times a little bit stranded were it not for the intervention of the mercy and the patience and the long-suffering of God who in spite of our disobedience will still come to our rescue and to our aid. We want to study this uh, theme and thought this morning under three headings. I'll mention them to you now so that you will see the direction that we are taking. We see, first of all, the reality of a lesson not learned. Secondly, we note the futility of a loyalty not earned. And third, the tranquility of a liberty not yearned, that is, desired. So let's note, first of all, the reality of a lesson not learned. The Moabites are in revolt. We have discovered that in the first few verses of the chapter. They have been bound to, and they have come under the powerful constraints of the military might of King David, who some years before sat upon the throne of Israel. All of the descendants of David have followed to a degree or to a point in the rightful rule over God's people Israel until they reached the point of division, disunity, disruption in the nation, and the nation was split, and now we have ten uh, tribes in the north, two in the south, and they no longer have an alliance in the sense of their continued rule. They are separate in every stretch of the imagination and use of the word. But one thing that they have shared in common is the results of the battles fought and the victories won by King David in particular and then by his son Solomon who followed in those early years. And so when we come into an engagement with Moab, we immediately note that there will be an impact as a result of this rebellion of Moab having been brought into servitude and forced to pay taxes for some 150 years since they were overthrown by King David, there will now be some repercussions that will be felt both in the northern kingdom and in the southern kingdom. So with all of this coming into play, the king in the north has decided that in order to stem the rebellion, to hold back the revolt, and to continue to hold power over Moab, there needs to be a coming together of both the north and the south. So, 
Jehoram, uh, you read of him in the first verses of the chapter, verse 1, for example, he now prepares to make war. And you see that thought coming out in verse 6. So King Jehoram went out of Samaria at that time and mustered all of Israel. So we have Samaria, the capital of the north, a center for gathering all of the military might, uh, and then down in the south in Jerusalem, we have King Jehoshaphat, and he is about to receive this, uh, this word to come to the aid of uh, uh, those in the north. Now, there are two thoughts that emerge from this that we want to, to draw out. The first one is uh, that of a pathetic association. Now, I mentioned a little earlier um, the, the fact that sometimes uh, alliances and allegiances do not always work out, especially if it involves doctrine. If we build a foundation on the platform of unity and we ignore doctrine, then we are bound to fail. And here in this passage, you will discover, and if you have not picked up on this already, that there is a real lack of total commitment to the Word of God on the part of either of these two kings. Now, Jehoshaphat in the south ought to have known better. But even he is prepared to neglect the disciplines of God's forewarnings and God's word of discipline and instruction. But here we have Jehoram. And Jehoram has a double issue. He has two problems. He is about to face one of the most severe battles, potentially, of all his reign as the king of Israel, the northern kingdom. He has long ago followed in the footsteps of his forefathers, and has abandoned the things of God, the teaching of God's word, and therefore has denied the rule of God upon his life and the nation over which he rules. So when it comes to a time of conflict, he cannot call upon the name of Jehovah for help because he has already committed himself to worship other gods. Now, just for a moment, you consider in your mind and heart, to whom does the ungodly pray in their time of need? To whom can they turn for help if they do not have that relationship with God and access through Christ to his divine enabling and his power. Well, you may say, why not turn to the gods that they worship? It's interesting to note that King Jehoram did not consult his pagan gods. Now, we may ask, why would that be? Is that not strange, surely? If he is committed to worshipping these gods, would he not call upon them for help in this time of need? Just take a little think back a few years to the role of the prophet Elijah. Recall how he stood on Mount Carmel and mocked the gods of Baal. If Baal is God, serve him. But if God is God, if Jehovah is God, then serve him. And in that moment of bitter testing, it was determined 
and decided that there was only one God to be worshipped. All the other gods, pagan, heathen, were simply imaginary powers that had no influence, no effect upon those that worshipped them. So here is Jehoram, and he is no one to turn to in his moment of need. See what he does now in verse 7, realizing that he has a problem, and it's a major problem. He turns to the south for help. Many a time, as a minister of uh, the gospel, I've been called to the bedside of someone who is dying. They haven't been attending church through their lifetime, apart from weddings or funerals. They haven't read their Bible for many years. They don't pray. They have no connection with the church. But all of a sudden, they feel the shadow of death creeping over them and they become afraid and they want to have something to hold on to before they pass out into eternity. So who do they send for? The priest or the pastor. And they sense or feel that somehow there needs to be a connection with something or someone before they pass the line. Here, in a sense, while death is not imminent, it is potential, but it's not, it's not looming on the horizon as a definite objective. But here is Jehoram, and he knows that somehow, when he's faced with this dilemma, he needs to approach those who know more about the things of God than he does. You may not fully appreciate or understand why God has placed you where he has. In that chosen career, in that place of employment, in that association with neighbors, family, or friends, you may not fully understand why God has created those circumstances around your life. But as we've noted earlier, We don't live according to luck or chance. We live according to the providence of God. And providence is something that is always there. It always has been there. As long as God has been, there has been providence. Providence is the medium through which God fulfills his purpose. And you may not comprehend at this stage why You are where you are. But there could well come a time when someone will walk your way, will come across your path, will tap you on the shoulder and engage you in conversation. And all they want to do is to find someone who can speak to them about Jesus. They may not fully understand themselves what their need is, But God has put within them a searching heart. And as they have considered the pull of God upon their life and upon their heart, they have remembered that here or there is someone who professes to be a child of God. Perhaps they can be of help in the journey and in the search of discovery about the things of God. That is why it is important for you and I, as God's people, to be that shining light wherever we may be. So when those around us are wanting someone to talk to them about Jesus, they will know to whom they should come. Wouldn't it be sad if you discovered they had a need and you approached them in order to talk to them about the things of God and their response was, I didn't know that you were a Christian. This becomes the challenge of the chapter. 
And now Jehoram, in verse 7, decides he must ask Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, for help. For if there is to be any approach made to God and from God, then surely the king of Judah, the one who followed in the covenant promises and blessings of God through David, he would be the one to help. As he comes, he has a bargaining chip, or so he feels. Had he not previously, as we've noted in other studies, gone a little bit of the way in denouncing these false gods. Remember how he removed some of the prominent statues and idols for worship, but he didn't break down the altar, so his repentance was only partial. But maybe a partial repentance would be sufficient to convince the king of Judah that he is genuine and earnest. So he feels that now he has a bargaining chip with which to come. You may say, oh well, I go to church. Maybe not every Sunday, but I go to church. And I'm really a good person. And, and, and I do believe in God. And you're supposing that you're building these little credentials, these little things that might at some point count when it comes down to the crucial moment. But here we discover that the power of the king of Judah cannot encompass, cannot fulfill all that is required in order for God to actively engage in this situation. And in fact, while he will not discover that for a little time, the prophet Elisha, who now is brought into the action, the prophet Elisha is going to drop a little hint to him that all is not well in his understanding of how we approach a holy God. And you'll see that in verse 13 and 14. Uh, the, prophet, the prophet in verse 13 sets out uh, the, the question, What have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. But the king of Israel said to him, No, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, Surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not look at you nor see you. You see, your credentials are not worthy of the attention of God. It is only when there is true repentance in the heart, a genuine desire to put away the idols and images of our lives, and embrace God totally and fully, it is then that God accepts us, hears our cry, and rushes to our aid. The second little theme, a pathetic association, is followed by a prophetic application. We won't go into this in depth uh, this morning, but remember in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 33, we have there the illustration, the account, the, the message that's driven home by Jesus as he describes the Pharisees who, who are saturated with their religious ideology and practice. They fulfill in as much as they can right to the simplest detail, the letter of the law. And Jesus confronts them with the words, On that day, when we're called to stand before God, or when Christ returns, 
There will be many who will say in that day, Lord, Lord, open unto us. In your name we've done this and that and the other. We have been deeply concerned about our religious practice. We followed it right through as much as we could all of our lives. And what will be the response of heaven? Depart from me, me, I never knew you. Here we have the warning that our repentance must be in earnest and must be complete. But let's note, secondly, the futility of a loyalty not earned. There were no early signs or associations in all that leads up to this request and uh, the result of it from the king of Israel to the king of Judah that would at any stage or to any degree suggest that this is a relationship that will last or that it will even work or that it is indeed the right thing to do. Nothing that has gone previously would suggest to us that at this point in time Israel and Judah can reunite for the one purpose of defeating their enemy and that they will succeed and life will settle back down to normal. No indications whatsoever. Let's just picture for one moment the tribes in the north as representing the world and the two in the south representing the people of God. Are there any suggestions around? Are there any evidences? Is there any proof that an alliance between the world and the church will work? The answer is there are none. In fact, there cannot be simply because the Scriptures warn us that we're not to be equally yoked together. And we need to observe that rule of discipline in our lives on the individual level and be careful with our associations. We can get ourselves in too deeply or too far that it's difficult to extract ourselves from it. So here we have this thought. Yet Jehoshaphat is prepared to commit to an unholy alliance, verse 7, before, and note this, before he has consulted with the mind of the Lord. It is a huge mistake for a non-believer to engage in any activity without seeking direction from God. And I say that carefully. But it's an even greater disaster when God's people engage in activities without consulting the mind and the will of God. What does the Bible tell us? Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. You all know it. You've learned it in Sunday school. It's written in your heart. You don't even have to look it up. There the writer who sets out clearly the defining principles of our daily walk with God instructs us that we're, verse 5, do not lean upon your own understanding. Verse 7, do not be wise in your own eyes. What are we to do? We are to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean upon your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Now we discover in this chapter, the third chapter of 2 Kings, the um, attitude of uh, Jehoshaphat. You see, this is not the first time that he's been met with this particular challenge. He had previously been 
asked to join in and fight for the cause of Israel. If uh, you go over to Second Chronicles chapter 18 and uh, look, uh, look at verse uh, 1 to 3, <clears throat> here we read, Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance, and by marriage he allied himself with Ahab. After some years he went down to visit Ahab in Samaria, and Ahab killed sheep and oxen in abundance for him and the people who were with him, and persuaded him to go up with him to Ramoth-Gilead. So Ahab king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat king of Judah, Will you go with me against Ramoth-Gilead? And he answered him, I am as you are, my people as your people, and we will be with you in the war. How can you fight with the world against the world? He already had been taught a lesson. Go over into chapter 19, look at the first three verses of that chapter. Then Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned safely to his house in Jerusalem, and Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Therefore the wrath of the Lord is upon you. Now wouldn't you think that he would have learned his lesson? But alas, here we are again, a repetition of the failure of that encounter. You see, Satan will work on us until he finds a vulnerable area in our lives. And once he has found that point of vulnerability, he will continue to attack it, to attack it, and to attack it. He will not give up working on it. But you see, as we read in Second Chronicles chapter 18, that Jehoshaphat had a vested interest, and therefore it persuaded him to become involved. He had married into the house of Ahab. So there is now a connection. He has, if you like, something in an invested interest in the north that will keep bringing him back even though God has forbidden it. You see, that is how the devil gets us. He keeps in our mind and in our heart some connection with the old life or with the world. Something we enjoy doing. It might even have become a habit. And we feel that somehow God will understand and he'll overlook it. But that very thing becomes the avenue through which Satan is able to engage our heart and our mind. We need to be careful with our associations in and with the world. To be fair to Jehoshaphat, when they had set off for battle and found themselves in the middle of a desert with no water, he realized his mistake. You see, sometimes God has to bring us there. Psalmist tells us in Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Why? I know that he's my shepherd. I know I shall not want, because he leads me to green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. You know, a sheep will not drink from a running stream. A sheep will only drink from still waters where there is safety. Well, God leads us into these pastures and beside the cool streams. But here in this passage, we also learn that there are times when God will lead us into the wilderness where there's no water. And he does that in order to instruct us, to engage us, to get our attention, and to remind us 
that he is our shepherd. So when they get into that situation, they um, begin to wonder how to address it. And immediately Jehoshaphat is aware, verses 11 through to 15, that they must now seek God. It's never too late, never too late to turn to the Lord and seek his attention upon our needy heart and our circumstances. Verses 11 to 15, he remembers the man of God, Elisha. Now Elisha has been somewhere in the wings. He has not been involved in all of this. But at the right time, when the moment of opportunity has come, and when God has now got the attention of these three kings, Elisha comes. And Elisha will make a difference because he is the man of God. He has the message of God. And he has discerned the will of God. Now God had uh, made no promise to uh, Jehoram that he would answer his prayer. But if um, you look at verse 14 of 2 Kings 3, you'll see that God had made a promise to um, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, that he uh, would answer his prayer. Second Kings chapter 3 and verse 14. Elisha said to the king of Israel, What have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. But the king of Israel said, No, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts live before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not look at you nor see you. God's about to answer prayer. But it won't be your prayer, Jehoram. It will be the prayer of Jehoshaphat. While the world art uh, around us may not realize it, a Christian will always add value to the environment in which they operate. So you need not feel inferior or feel that your faith is so weak it's of no value. If you're a child of God, then wherever you are, you will make your environment more valuable because God answers the prayers of his people. We could go over into Ezekiel chapter 14. You can look this up when you go home and read there the first three verses. God said he would not answer the prayers of Israel. They had turned their back on him. He now turns his back on them. But in Psalm 34 verse 15, 1 Peter 3, 12, God has promised to answer the prayers of his people. Now we come to the final thought, and just very briefly, you will notice that we've been drawn into the vortex of this discovery of how God is able to use the impossible and the unusual to bring about the miracles of his love and grace. And you will see in verse 15 that uh, the miracle all begins with music. Sometimes we don't appreciate or realize just how important music is. Now let me say this, there is music and there is music. And not all music is God honoring and God glorifying. And we need to maintain that uh, understanding and ensure that uh, music becomes a vital part of our worship. But that is what it does. It leads us in our worship. Some music will touch the emotion. Some will touch the heart. And uh, music that is well presented and well played becomes a vital ingredient in the worship of God. Now, we know that God has talented many of you here in this area. And uh, I would encourage you to keep on 
using that ministry and talent for the glory of God. God gives us talents, not that we should bury them in the ground. In other words, you're not to just play the violin at home in your bedroom when you want to annoy your parents. And don't pick up the bagpipes because that will annoy the neighbors as well as the, your parents. Uh, when God has given you a gift and a talent, then you need to cultivate that and to be motivated to use that for the glory of God. Come with me to uh, Psalm 98. and I'll just take a moment to, to look at this with you. Psalm 98. And uh, verses 4 to, uh, to 6. Psalm 98, verses 4 to 6. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth in song, rejoice and sing praises. Sing to the Lord with the harp. With the harp, and here's an interesting comment. And the sound of a psalm. You might ask, what does a psalm sound like? Well, a psalm on the outward, sounds like uh, it's sung. It could be accompanied by music. It could be sung without music. But what does it really mean, the sound of a psalm? Well, the psalm becomes, in essence, the expression of the heart. And this is another way of saying what we read in the New Testament, we ought to sing to the Lord with grace in our heart. In other words, the motivation for the music comes from within. It's a connection that we have in response to the gift that God has given us. So the sound of the psalm is something that comes from within. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. So music becomes important, even essential in worship, because music is the contribution that God makes to the church to enable us to sing with melody in our heart. Now, let me read a little bit more. With trumpets and the sound of a horn, we haven't heard the horn yet, shout joyfully before the Lord, the King. Now, come back to First Chronicles chapter 25 and, and just see how this has been set up or arranged, if you like. First Chronicles chapter 25. Verse 1. Moreover, David and the captains of the army separated for the service some of the sons of Asaph, of Heman, of Jidathan, who should prophesy with harps. So here we have the sound of a psalm, and now we have harps prophesying, preaching, speaking, moving the hearts of those who hear. Stringed instruments, cymbals, and the number of the skilled performing men performing their service was. And then it lists how many of them there were. Look at verse 3, the last part. Who prophesied with a harp to give thanks and praise to the Lord. Look at verse 7. The number of them with their brethren who were instructed in the songs of the Lord all who were skillful was 288. Can you imagine having 288 musicians all lined up here playing on Sunday morning? We would all have to sit in the car park 
church wouldn't hold them all. But can you imagine the sound? And all through the Old Testament you'll find that essential to worship, there were two things. There was the music, usually led by a silver trumpet. There were the singers. And if you go to Isaiah chapter 12, you'll hear how vitally important the singers were in the temple. Not every Levite was a preacher. Not every Levite officiated in the slaughter of sacrificial animals at the altar. There were Levites who were specially called and gifted to be musicians in the temple. In verse 8, you see they cast lots for their duty, the small as well as the great, the teacher with the student. So they were all eager, so eager to play in the temple. They couldn't have 288 there at one time. So they would draw lots and uh, choose that way how they would go in to play the music. Now notice the association in verse 15 of Second Kings chapter 3. And I want you musicians to take this thought to heart. 2 Kings 3, verse 15. Then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. Now there are two thoughts that are involved in this. One is, the hand of the Lord came upon him the musician that was playing. You see, as we're blessing others, God is blessing us. So if you want to be specially blessed, then learn how to play the violin. There's a blessing upon those who play. But then secondly, the hand of the Lord came upon him we're also looking at Elisha, the prophet. So he has been asked to give a word from the Lord. And the first thing he says to them is, bring me a musician. And the musician comes and begins to play. And as they play, the hand of the Lord comes upon the prophet Elisha. So it's not only aiding or helping the music and the singing, but the musicians also have an application to the preaching of the word. It settles the heart and the mind. And appropriately played leads us into our worship and the meditation of God's word. That's why as we need to guard the pulpit, we need to guard the band or the musicians who were playing on Sunday morning. This is a vital uh, aspect of our worship. Now, just as we conclude, notice the miracle as it's introduced, verse 16 and verse 17. Thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water so that you, your cattle, and your animals may drink. Now note the connection here. Remember when Elisha was, when Elijah was questioning the presence of God when he was in the cave. And God told him, come out, stand at the door of the cave, and I'm going to pass you by. Remember what happened? There was thundering and lightning and earthquakes and all of these things. And uh, one would have to be really blind to the workings of God, not to notice that God was doing something. But here, God is doing nothing. No sound of rain. No sound of a rushing flood. Suddenly, it, it, it appears it has happened quietly and insignificantly, but it becomes just as powerful as the appearance of God on the mountain with Elijah. You see, God doesn't always herald his coming with force and authority and power. Even to the prophet Elijah, it was the still, 
small voice that awakened him to the presence of God. So just because you pray and nothing happens, and you pray and still nothing happens or appears to be happening, do not be disappointed. Simply wait and keep on praying. For sooner or later, in the timing of God's purpose, he will bring to pass the miracle that will change your life and the life of those around you. Remember Noah. 120 years it took him to build an ark. There were no other signs of God doing anything. But the insistence of the building day after day after day in the middle of the desert, building a boat in the middle of the desert that no one could even think of moving. And yet God was at work. Here Judah are told, send out the men. Tell them to lay off their armor, put down their weapons. We know they're here to fight. But had they listened to God at the beginning, they would have known that there's no need for them to fight. God will do the fighting for them. Tell them to put on their dungarees and go out and build dams right throughout the valley. And so they do. And mysteriously the waters come. And the dams are filled up to overflowing. Remember how Elijah prayed and God sent the rain. Now Elisha prays and God sends the rain. But notice in verse 20, when the rain came. It was when the grain offering was being offered back in Jerusalem. See, you cannot divorce, you cannot disconnect, you cannot remove what God is doing in his church, in his people, in his word, from what happens in your life and mine on the everyday basis of our existence. It all begins in the house of God. It all begins in the presence of God. And when God's people are praying in Jerusalem, God is at work in the wilderness of Moab. Here then is the practical application of the miracle. Just read down through the final verses of the chapter. When the king of Moab looked out and saw the water glistening in the sun and these large dams, they looked to him as though there had been an internal uh, disarray, a fighting from within themselves, and uh, they had all been killed. Blood immediately came to mind, and they thought it was the blood of their enemy, Israel, Judah, and more. But not long from this realization, the earth will see the blood of the Moabites as God performs a miracle of deliverance for his people. How does this all end? What does it teach us? What is the lesson of this chapter. Well, there are many, as we have noted, but here is the main lesson. How does God intervene in your life and mine? How does he rescue us from the enemy of our soul? It is only by the precious blood of Jesus. And here in this passage is a foreshadowing, a foretelling of the great deliverance through the cross. Have you proved it? 
Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? There can be no other way. Let's bow for prayer. Loving Father, we thank you for your word afresh today and pray that these simple, practical lessons will find a resting place, a lodging place, a fixed place within our minds and hearts so that like the psalmist, we will be able to say, I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. And this we pray in our Savior's name and for his sake. Amen. We turn for our closing hymn.